who was actually at my uh, daughter's wedding and, and set a bracha under the chuppah, and probably the last time he wasn't 770, it was uh, seven years ago. I hope to publicize that picture later this week. <clears throat> he was a very refined, per, very ref- refined person and a big Talmud Chacham. Um, so that's that. Okay. So we want a little Fabreng. Yeah? You know, I was just going to say that we definitely want the Fabreng about what we talked about last week. About, But I have to say that this, these two Rabbanim that were Nifta that we lost, maybe, maybe, maybe we could ask you to speak about each one, maybe for just a very brief moment, because... It's very significant that we that that we lost them. Okay, <clears throat> okay, not well, you know, the little I know, I'm not you know very well versed in their lives, uh, and their you know, but um, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Yonis and Sachs, known as Jonathan Sachs, was a very brilliant uh, philosopher. He studied philosophy. That that was his, um, you know, his degree was in philosophy, and. Um, I'm not sure if he studied at Yeshiva University under Rabbi Salavechik. I was trying to figure it out this morning, but if not, he definitely identified and uh, learned, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, thing, teachings of uh, Rabbi Salavechik, uh, the Rav. So, you know, already that put him in a uh, in an arena, in a domain where he had, um, you know, a comfort level with uh, the Rebbe and Lubavitch. And in, in addition to that, he met uh, some of the senior rabbis in Shluchim in, in England, Rabbi uh, Shmulu and uh, Rabbi Fivish Vogel and, and others who, you know, were very, you know, bright, intelligent, and um, they uh, exposed, exposed them to the teachings, I believe, of the Rebbe. Again, whether they were the first, I don't know, but... And uh, he, you know, wrote... Uh, in English, his his writing is superb. If you've read his writing, it's it's his speaking was superb, and his writing was 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 tremendous. And he wrote Torah studies, which you've seen probably, right? It's the Rebbe's some classic yeah, st- some classic sikhs yeah. of the Rebbe that he put into you know uh, everyday English for intelligent people. You know, uh, not Oxford English, uh, where, you, you know, thou, and you know, those type of words where you don't really understand half of the things. And to do that, it's a great accomplishment because, you know, the, the Sikhs, uh, the Rebbe spoke, said them in Yiddish. Then they, you have to put that into English. And to, it was a great feat. And uh, in the Chabad world, uh, this was uh, used, I myself used it over the years. In giving classes, because he had he had very good, the way he presented the ideas were were very good, uh, especially for uh, teaching a balabatim and all that. And um, he uh, he had yechidus. Uh, I think it's online. Uh, some of it um, he tells, and the Rebbe, you know, the Rebbe, you know, he thought he would be going in for a bracha, and the Rebbe kept him there for a long time and and discussed with him. You know what can be done for students in 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 England and and things like that. And uh, so between I, I the way I see it, this is my own uh, humble opinion. Between Rabbi Salavechik and the Rebbe and uh, Rabbi Steinzaltz, who you know who he knew and respected, I think that gave him um, a real understanding of uh, of 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 Chabad, of Lubavitch, of the Rebbe, and, and he and he had a very, very um, deep feeling and, and, and uh, for Chassidus, for Chassidus, <laughs> that's good. So, you know, he was a philosopher, right? And of course he was a chief rabbi, and those are very different positions. And in addition to that, he was, he wasn't, a, you know, a Chassid, I don't, know if, I don't think he wore a gartel, and, and th- but, but in his mind, it seems to me that he was... Um, very Hasidic, very Chabad Hasidic, you know, the Chochma Bina Das. And uh, you listen to, to a talk of his last night, we were here at, uh, during Balava Malka, listening a little bit. <clears throat> you know, he was a very, very, um, he saw he saw the larger world. He, you know, he, he, he really, and that wasn't an old man, he really got a very good understanding of, of, 
of the world and 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 the, what the contribution of, of of Yidin Jews are to the world. What he had a, a very um, broad vision, a broad vision of of what Yiddishkeit is and what Hakadosh Baruch Hu wants. Another amazing thing that came out yesterday. I don't know if you read it or heard it, but he. He had uh, the machla, the illness, when he, in his 30s. And he had it again in his 50s. And now he had it in the 70s, and he succumbed to it, right? But no one knew really about it that he had it in the 30s and the 50s. He never spoke about it. And um, there were some comparisons made to some other great people, Jewish and Lahabdu, not Jewish, who you know, were ill. And, and they you know, spoke about, through their poetry and writing and music, they, they speak about their illness and a way to overcome it. Uh, he didn't do that. So that's something uh, interesting, you know. It's, uh, it's interesting. And uh, you could say, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you could say that. I was going to say that uh, some, you see a look at Jewish leaders, do they talk about their own, you know, health and issues, you know, not necessarily, you know? I don't know. Anyway, so that's really, I think, depends on the person. Some people need the, the outlet. Regardless of how great and bright you are or, or not, some people, by talking about it, it makes it easier for them. And other people, uh, it's not that way. Whatever. So that's a little bit about Rabbi Rabbi Sachs. It's um, it's a great loss for the collective Jewish world, maybe not the Hasidic world of Meir Sharon Geula and Baruch Park and Williamsburg, but definitely for the collective Jewish world. Yes, yes, you know. Uh, I'm to just re- uh, re- uh, restore a certain memory. I remember a story that I think was Rabbi Sachs of him sending a letter to the Rebbe, uh, and the Rebbe sent sent the letter back to him with the word, the letter I circled. He told the story. Uh, are you familiar with this? No, it's not with him. The story is with Rabbi Weinreb of Baltimore. I don't think so. I, Which story? Which I story? I don't think so. I think that was Rabbi Sachs. I know Rabbi Weinreb. Which story? Uh, the, st- the story is that the, one of these gentlemen, one of these great gentlemen, uh, sent a letter to the Rebbe, uh, and the Rebbe sent the letter back circling every time he used the word I, kind of like uh, reflecting back uh, uh, a, a, a center, a, being centered on himself in a certain way. Uh, Rabbi Weinreb, the story is that there's a Jew in Bo- there's a Jew in Washington to right. consult with named Weinreb. Okay, okay, so maybe you're right. Yeah, that okay. If you, um, if you tell me it's two different uh, stories, that, that's the one I meant. Yeah, I think it's I think it's two different stories. Okay, okay. I, I, you know, it's it. Uh, it's I, just, it. I, just, I just it came to my mind. If it right, was Rabbi Sachs, you know, is it Well, 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 well it, it's interesting you say that because yesterday in the talk that I heard here, I don't know when it's from. But he's speaking about, he suggest. oh, it was a TED Talk. It was a TED Talk. It's online. So he says, I suggest... The Rabbi Sachs gave? Uh, uh, Rabbi Sachs, yeah, about a, about a 10 minute. And it's, it's, it's excellent. Okay. And, and, and there he says, I suggest, the bottom line is that we substitute for the word self, other. You got to listen to it. So he uh, says, instead of self-improvement, other improvement. Instead of self-esteem, uh, other esteem. So, Very good. you know, maybe that's, that's in, in line with what you're telling me, the story with the Rebbe. But um, I'm sure it can be found online. Okay. Now, just to jump over to the Rebbe David Feinstein. Um, Rebbe David Feinstein was like his father, a most humble, humble person. You know, I always say that the greatness of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is not the amount of Torah that he knew and the Psak, and it was considered the Posek Adur, because... That's that's a given, and in every generation you had one or two such people. But it's the humility to have such such knowledge and 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 to have such humility. He was so humble in his shul in the Lower East Side. No, no, no. You know, it was the same shul building, yeshiva building, wherever you davened over there. 
um, for the last 60 years, <laughs> you know? And, and, and you could find a great Torah scholar sitting with him, talking with him, or a little boy talking to him, or a teenager, and like, without any fanfare whatsoever. And that's, you know, tremendous uh, humility, anova. And that, that, to me, is the real sign of, of a person who's, who's really uh, a, a, a Talmud Chochem, the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants a Talmud Chochem to be, to be bereft of, of, of gaiva and ego. Now, Reb David, Reb David, his son, he had the two sons, Reb David and Reb Ruven. Reb Ruven Reuven. is a little younger, and uh, Baruch Hashem is still alive, and he heads the yeshiva in Staten Island. The Teferis Yushalayim has a division in Staten Island, which is across the Verrazano Bridge here in next, you know, between uh, Borough Park, Bensonhurst, and, and Staten Island. Anyway, um, Rev. Dubbard was also a very modest person. I recall um, we asked him to read the Ksuba under the Chuppah, and he refused. Now, he's older than his brother. He was a much known as, you know, he's a much greater Talmud Chachem in, in Psak for sure. He was seen as the replacement for his father in Psak, in, in Halacha. So, you know, at a Chuppah, usually you, the, the reading of the Ksuba is given to either a Rosh Hashiva, a Rav. I mean, again, I'm not, it doesn't say it has to be that way. And, you know, but, you know, you, you want someone who's, who's able to read Arab. Aramaic, you know, and, and, and knows where to stop and where to start. You know, sometimes people read the Ksuba, and uh, if you listen to them, it, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it feels, you know, there's I- I- ignorance. There's, there's a lack of, um, of knowing, you know, what they're saying, and they read through sentences without the periods. Because A, it's in Aramaic, and B, you have to know what it says. Yeah, and it's based on the Gemara and Ksubas, and, and, you know what I'm saying, and Halacha. So you try to give it to someone who is a, a, a shtikl Talmud Chochem, right? So who, who better than Reb David Feinstein to read the Ksuba at our daughter's wedding? And he refused. You know, he said, I'm older, or it's hard for me to stand as long. But I felt it was like humility. I really felt it was... And, and, and who read it was his brother, Reb Ruvain, uh, read it, you know. My, my, uh, my son-in-law's mother... His father was the administrator for Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Yeshiva's Tferis Yerushalayim in the Lower East Side. His name was Kapilovich, Rabbi Kapilovich. And in fact, he has smicha from Rabbi Moshe, and in one of my upcoming books, I'm going to uh, publish uh, the smicha and some, uh, some nice pictures. And, and so they were very, very close, very tight. I mean, in a way, you know, without this Rabbi Kapilovich, Rabbi Moshe's Yeshiva wouldn't, Go anywhere. He had, you know, the financial end, you know, the, the grants, the programs, the tuitions, whatever. So, 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 but, but he, he, uh, he didn't want to read the ksuba. He didn't want to read the ksuba. So we gave him a bracha. There's a picture of that, some pictures. You know, we honor with a bracha, of course. And, and you have to understand that in the last 30 years or 40 years, not many Litayan, not many Litvaks, <laughs> came to 770. <laughs> okay, uh, it just it, it just wasn't, uh, you know, Chabad took a certain approach. I'm talking even before the whole Mashiach controversy. You know, the Rebbe came out with the Mitzoyim in the 70s, the mitzvah campaigns, and a lot of a lot of people Rabbanim, they were they had an issue with it. You know, it was very different to what they knew Lubavitch in Russia, Rabbi Moshe came from a city, Lubyan, Luban. Rabbi Moshe's best, his chavrusa was a Jew by the name of Rabbi Shimon Trebnik. Rabbi Shimon Trebnik's brother was Rabbi Nochem Trebnik, who was my father's Rosh Hashiva in Lud Lubavitch Yeshiva in the 1950s. And he became a Lubavitcher. He was a Talmud Reb Nochem of the Chofetz Chaim in Radin, of, you know, the Radun in Yeshiva. Somehow he, he was Naskarev to Lubavitch, and he became Lubavitch. And his brother was like best friends with Ramosha. 
And, and every year when Reb Nochen would come to New York for Tishrei, for, to the Rebbe for Tishrei, he would visit and, and they spent time. They were very, very close. You know, and, and all this contributed to Reb Moshe had a tremendous, uh, I don't know if you read it, but I've, I've written a lot about it and writing more about it. And I hope one day maybe to have an exclusive book on Reb Moshe and the Rebbe. But the, 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 he had a, Great Derech Heretz for the Rebbe, and the Rebbe had great Derech Heretz for him. He had a wonderful, wonderful relationship. But nevertheless, you know, the, <clears throat> the people around Rabbi Moshe didn't feel that way many times. And he took positions that they were upset about. I mean, I, you know, I wrote, they were upset about. And, and some even wanted to oust him from his leadership as the head of Akudis Harabonim in New York, because they felt he doesn't have the backbone in various issues, not just with Lubavitch, to stand up and, 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 and you know, say a different opinion. They felt he was, you know, more, uh, you know, more soft. And he was soft. He was soft. Okay? So there was a lot of politics all around, but he did not... Pay attention to that. And if he felt something is right, he said it. And Ramosh and, and with, with Lubavitch and the Rebbe, he sided with the Rebbe. Almost in every issue, he sided with the Rebbe, at least publicly, okay? And this was something that many of his contemporaries who worked with him were not happy about. I mean, I know this from the inside, from his secretary who's a Lubavitcher, he was a clandestine Lubavitcher, and he was hired in 69, and he, he worked with Ramosha till I think, 1980, and, and he lives in Eretz Yisrael, I'll give you that hint, and you, I don't think you guys know him, uh, and he's a gold, a gold mine of information, and I've been getting information from him, and you could write a whole book about the behind the scenes of the Rabbonim, and it's, it's a whole discussion. I really don't want to discuss it, not, not at least on Facebook, you know. So, so, what's my point? I'm making a long point. The point is like this, that, that although, the, so, so, so to, for, for Litvisher Rabbonin to come to 770 from the 70s and on was not, was not a daily occurrence. It wasn't a monthly occurrence either. It was a very exception to the rule, right? So here in, 2000, in 2013 for David Feinstein, who we're talking about, who passed away, and, um, and his brother Abruvain to come to the wedding at 770, you know, is, is a statement. It's a statement that, um, you know, they're not just coming because the, of the familiar connection with... Um, my, you know, my, my son-in-law's mother, but also because, you know, at the end of the day, they knew what Lubavitch and the Rebbe repre- represented, and they knew it because of their father. Did you, did, did you guys know that in 1942, there was a serious consideration for Rabbi Moshe to become the Rosh Hashiva of 770? That I didn't know. 1942, and if not for a family member, he would have been the Rosh Hashiva, the, the, the previous Rebbe of Yosef Yitzchak, and, and, and the staff of Shmuel Levitin, Rebbe Sol Jacobson, and Rebbe Mentlik, the, the, like the board, you could say, they wanted him. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would have been, I, I think about it, you imagine, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would have been known as the, as the Rosh Hashiva of Lubavitch, I think it would have put Lubavitch in, in the Orthodox Haredi American world on a whole different plateau. But it was uh, stopped because of a, a relative who, I'm not going to go into the details, but you can hear it online from Rabbi uh, Greenblatt, who's like 95 years old, and he was a student in the yeshiva, and he says, I remember when so-and-so came daily, to talk to Rabbi Moshe and discourage him from taking the job. So the point I'm making is that Rabbi Moshe had a, you know, a, a good feeling because he was an Isha Emes. And his son, this Reb David, seems to me, the little I knew about him, that he had the same humility and the same Emeskite, 
the same truthfulness. You know, there are amongst the Litvish and Rosh Hashivas and, and, and Poskim and Rabbonim, you know, and uh, whatever, they, there is the more of the sense of, you spoke about Hillel, the I, the ego, the self, you know, that's, that's part of a certain culture, okay? It's not just uh, an individual, there's a culture, you know? And um, the Feinsteins, at least Reb Moshe and Reb, Dov- and Reb David, uh, uh, were not that way. And I think that is a, uh, a tremendous, um, a tremendous schus uh, that such a yid, you know, gave to the Jewish world for 91 years. You know, for 91 years, he gave um, that schus. He was also very careful not to kind of deviate from his father's piske dinim rulings. Just last night, I heard a little short clip about cessation of life. At what point do you consider one to be dead? And Rabbi Moshe Shita was, he, he argued and believed at the point of when you stop breathing. So the interviewer, a few of them, they were talking to him. They said, well, Rabbi Tendler argues it's not that. And Rabbi Tendler is his brother-in-law. Avi, Rabbi Tendler, Moshe Tendler is the brother-in-law to Rabbi David Feinstein. Rabbi Moshe Tendler married on Moshe's daughter. So I, 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 was, I paid attention to the way he answered the question. He said, I cannot tell you what my brother-in-law said, nor what he knows. Now, he's a biologist. Rabbi Moshe Tendler was a, a PhD, I believe, in biology. You know, if he, if he argues that otherwise, you know, I, maybe he's right. I can't tell you. I, all I can tell you is what my father said. And and, 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 and and the interviewer is like probing him from the right and the left and inside and outside. So w- what do you see? I, I, I really uh, appreciate it. And this, is, this, I think, is also, you know, associated with humility. You know, if you're going to say over, if you're going to repeat something in the name of Arav, in the na- especially when it comes to an issue of deciding what moment is death. You know, here there's no room for, uh, you know, fantasies. It's this or not. You know, you, know, you know what I'm saying, right? It's very serious. And he was very careful just to repeat. And you should listen to it. It's online. It's not a long clip. And I think if you see the way he answers the question, tells you about him. That's the point I'm making. Moshe asked to tell you a little bit about him. So I'm just sharing what I just what I saw, and it tells you what type of person. There are people who are very flippant, and even in, in when they repeat things in this one's name and that one's name, and they add a nuance here and a twist here and up and a down. You have to be very careful, especially when it comes to piski dinim. But not only when it comes to rulings and halacha. The Mishnah says that whoever repeats something in someone's name. You bring redemption to the world. What do we understand from that chazal? How careful you have to be when you repeat it. In other words, if you don't pre- repeat it properly, you're not bringing geula to the world. On the contrary, God forbid, you're bringing destruction to the world. Why? Because you're destroying that person. And by the way, that's one reason, Yonison, why in Chabad... And in some other communities, but in Chabad, we, 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 we know it's a big issue. We don't, eulo- we don't eulogize someone. We don't make a hespit. Why not? Why not? Because we, we're afraid that the person who will eulogize the person will say something that isn't exactly the case and true. Because the nature is that when you talk about a person, and here is just passed on, and here are all these good mourners and people... You want to make them feel good. That's not, you know, is it appropriate to say a lie about a person at that time? So in Lubavitch, in Chabad, the mini is not to eulogize someone. I'll tell you a story. In 1964, 
a rov in Tel Aviv. His name was Rabbi Shoyel Ber Zislin. He was a, ma- a great Talmud Chochem. He was a Chabad Rav, and he learned in Lubavitch, in, in the original Shiva, in the early 1900s, or when even the Yeshiva was founded. He was from the first students there. And he was a very, very uh, Mushlam. We call such a, he was good in Gemara, good in Hasidus, good in singing, good in organizing. He, like, he had all the, tra- right, all the traits. And this Rav Shoyel Ber Zislin, passed away in Elul of 1964. Now, he was a rav in a, in, in a local shul in Tel Aviv. I forget now the name. I wrote it down in this shul. A known shul, a big shul, hundreds of people, no chassid, you know what I'm saying? A, a shul, who knows if it was, a, might have been Shvard, Ashkenaz, whatever. And he had a lot to do with making mikvahs kosher in the city, in Tel Aviv. And because of his knowledge, he was looked at and respected, and he, and he was part of the respected Rabbonim in Eretz Yisrael in those years. I'm talking now about in the 40s, in the 50s. So he knew, and, and he came from Russia, so he knew Rabbonim and people from Russia, okay? And like I've told you many times, the issue of Hasidim and Mesnagdim, Hasidim and Litvaks in Russia those years was not a big issue. It wasn't a big issue. Yeah, Purim, you'd, you know, you'd make a joke about each other, you know what I'm saying? But they intermarried with each other, and I can give you names of families to, that even that come from such intermarriages, okay? Between Hasidim and Mesnagdim, and it, was, it wasn't an issue, because the culture was the same. You know, how does a Litvak, a real Litvak from Russia speak Yiddish like a Lubavitcher? The, 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 the accent is mamish like a Chabadik and a Chabadik like a, like a, they don't, we don't speak like, they don't speak like Hungarians or Galicianers or Polish people. They speak like Russia and Lithuania. Okay. So there was a, there was a commonality. It was a very strong commonality. Okay. So, so Rabbi Zislin was part of that uh, environ. Anyway, in 64 he passes on, and there's a yeshiva that you've heard of today. It's called Slabotka. And it was known then, and there was a yeshiva, Hevron, Hevron Yeshiva, right? One of the Rosh Yeshivas was a yid by the name of Rabbi Yecheskel Sarna. They, they called him Rabbi Chatzkel Sarna. Did you hear his name? Okay, and he came from Slabotka in, 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 in Europe, in the big Talmud Chochem, and he knew Rabbi Zislin. At the Levaya, he shows up. It's in Tel Aviv, and I think he lived in Yerushalayim, or right where the yeshiva was, the Chavon Yeshiva. And he goes over to Rabbi Yaakov Landau, Right, the Landau's have been the rabbonim of Bnei Brak, and Rabbi Landau was a was a friend of Rabbi Sar of of, of Rabbi Zislin. They were both Lubavitchers. Rabbi Yankel, right? They both learned Lubavitch. So he was conducting the Levaya. So he goes over to him and he says, "Rabbi Harav Landau," um, in Yiddish, you know, he said. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to be maspid. I'd like to eulogize Rabbi Zislin. I prepared a eulogy. So Rabbi Lando uh, turns to him and he says, Haraf Sarna, <laughs> with all the re- respect, Haraf Sarna, it's so wonderful that you would like to say a few words for, for Rabbi Shail Ber Zislin. But the minig in Lubavitch, in Chabad, is we don't make Hespedim. We take the person from the, from the, the, the Tahara straight to the Kaver, we say a Kaddish, and do the, the rituals, and we go back. That's it. Yes? Can I ask you a question about that? I've, not, I've, always, I've always been puzzled by that, what that meant, that we don't make Hespedim, because I've heard you and other people... In what I would consider a stadium is the distinction that you're making 
that normally there are circumstances in which hespadium are made before somebody's buried? Yes. In in the in okay. the in in either in the uh, in the funeral home, you know, or okay. some yeah, uh, okay. or some, uh-huh. yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I mean, that's what they meant. Oh, like, like in the in the funeral home, got it. Yeah, okay. or or, or, in the, or in the yeshiva or in the shul where the person was a rav or a rosh yeshiva or or of course, yeah. of, and by the way, it's not just for rosh yeshivas. The, the the by the lit, lit, litoim, the litfax, uh, they they make us pay them regularly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, and and also Hilo, you see in halacha regarding not say, making his baden during the nisin. So you do see there's an inya from making his baden, right? Because mm-hmm. it's okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, mm-hmm. the bottom line is Rabbi Sarna couldn't swallow this. He couldn't swallow it. In other words, and, and now I'm paraphrasing. Okay, he came from Yerushalayim in 1964. You didn't get into, you know, a, a, a jet car or a, or, or a, or, or, or a plane. <laughs> you had to slip on a bus and buses and those, you know, <clears throat> it's a big deal. And it takes away time from teaching and being a yeshiva, Bittl Taira, he's doing it for, and he comes there, and Rabbi Landau tells him, I'm not letting you make a, hesp- a hespit. I mean, that was like very shocking to him. And he stands over there, and he sees that another, a student of, of, um, of Rabbi Zislin, goes over to his casket, and this was Rav Shleim Chaim Kesselman, the Mashpia in Kvar Chabad, who I've told you about many times, my father's Mashpia. And he says, I, I don't know, Shoyel Bed, how, however he addressed this Rebbe, his Mashpia, he says, when you go to heaven, this is something Lubavitch you see them do. You know, notify the Rebbe, notify our Rebbe that, uh, that, you know, that you're there and we're here and it's like, give, give, regard, give regards to the Rebbe. It's very, you know, uh, very like out of the box. But that's something that older Chassidim and, and others in Lubavitch did. I, again, what's the source? I don't know, but it's a, is it a feeling? Whatever. When Rabbi Sarna heard, heard that, listen to what he said. He said like this. I see that not only do you play Rebbe and Chassid on earth, but I see you play Reb and Chassid also in heaven. In, in other words, like, you know, at the end of the day, he was a Litvak. He, he wasn't a Chassid. So to him, the whole idea of a Reb and Chassidim is like, it's like a game, okay? You know what I'm saying? He doesn't relate to it. It's not his cup of tea. But he, so he, you know, but he says, it, even in heaven, there's a Reb. <laughs> <laughs> So why am I sharing this with you? There were Litvish and Rosh Hashivas and, and Rabotnam and people who, you know, they, they, they stayed with and kept and they didn't have that humility towards another path. That's the way they were raised. That's the, it's not bad. It's the way they, their culture. <clears throat> what I'm saying is... Uh, I think, it seems to me, that the humility that Moshe Feinstein and his son, Rav David Sholem, had was uh, a much more humble towards others, and particularly in Lub- with Lubavitch and Chabad, it seems, to, it seems from various things, including, you know, that the Reb in the late 70s suggested to Rav Moshe to, to restart wearing um, to wear Rabbi Tom's films. So Moshe wrote to the Rebbe back. He used to put them on in Europe, but he didn't find a sofa, Yerushalayim here, to write him parshas so, of Rabbi Tom. So the Rebbe said, no problem. So he sent him Rabbi Zerkin. And Rabbi Zerkin wrote the parshas for Moshe Rabbi Tom's film. And that type of... And, 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 and he started to put him on albeit maybe privately, not in public, in the base of Medrash, in the shul. 
But he, we know that he 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 wore those tefillin. I've been in towns. I'm, I don't think many Litvish and Rosh Hashivas and Rabbonim would do that, you know, even if the Lubavitcher Rebbe sent them a pair of Rabbeinu Tams. I'm not so convinced. So this is a little bit more about uh, Rabbi Moshe, but his son, if you, if you see him, his, 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 even his physical body and his, his posture, he, he was like Rabbi Moshe, short, he wasn't tall. You know, Rabbi Moshe married a tall lady. Did you know that? His wife was a tall. So they asked him, so he says, I want to have tall children. <laughs> but but not all of his children were tall. I think some were taller, but uh, Reb David seems like he was more the, the height of his father, which was pretty, it was pretty short. Reb Roisha was really short, you know. So Reb Roisha, that's, that's, that's that. Yes, Jonasen. He certainly got this to what? Look up to her. He certainly got to look up to her. He has he has he has definitely what to look after, you said? No, he said he has to look up to her. Oh <laughs> he has to look up to her. Right. Okay, so uh, just a little bit about the, the Rebra Shab. And the Khsilis maybe will continue another time. But um The, the Rebbe Rashab, who's, uh, whose 160th birthday, Yemel this was yesterday, Chof Cheshvin. I told you that the Chosid of the Tzamach Tzedek, yet known as Rashbats, Reb Shmuel Batsalo, called him the Rambam of Chassidus Chabad, where he splits hairs and is very analytical. And truly, until the Rashab, we call him the Rashab, or the Rebbe Nishmasei, Nishmasei Eden, that's another way that he was referred to. Until him, the Chabad Hasidus was really, even for Chabad Hasidim, more of a closed book for the average Hasid. It was only those gifted Hasidim, very knowledgeable ones, who were very, who were able and capable of understanding um, the, uh, lots of the concepts. And the reason is of Chabad Hasidus, as we've been learning for years, and at times we come to some very, you know, intellectual pieces. And you have to be very steeped in it, and, 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 and you have to understand it, and it takes a lot of mind work and time and, and knowledge. And the average Chassid in Lithuania and in Russia and here and there didn't have that time uh, because they were running around to make a living and, and, and making sure that, uh, you know, they're not persecuted. So it was really a, a closed book. And if you look really into the Maimorim of the Tzemach Tzedek, not Derech Mitzvah Secha, which maybe one day we'll learn a little bit. I'd like to see that happen. But, you know, Oira Teira. Oira Teira is, um, is a, uh, like a 20, 25 set volume or more of the Tzemach Tzedek's Maimorim. So, it's, right, so elaborate, but yet the style of the Maimorim is more, uh, is not, is different than the Rashab. Let's, for, what do I mean? He'll bring a medrash, then I'll bring a piece of Kabbalah, and then I'll bring a piece of Gemara, and then I'll bring them together. And it's a wonderful study, and it's Hasidus. But you could tell that it's three separate things that he's putting together. The integration of them, of, of everything being one, where you can't tell almost that it's all being put together, and the development of those ideas in an elaborate way, in an analytical way, began with the Rashab, only the Rashab. <clears throat> the Rashab said about himself, I think it was in 1894, it's, it's printed in the talks of the previous Rebbe, he says, he says, I, it bothers me that I didn't have the time to sit as many hours with Hasidim and and listen to them relate to history and stories of Hasidim of the past. He writes that. He said that, and his son, the Rebbe Rayatz, writes it. So, what do you mean you didn't have time? What were you doing, Lepavich? You know, you were playing golf. Like, what were you doing? And he says that he was involved with Hasidic thought. And, 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 and to understand Hasidic thought... The ideas, the, what we call the Haskola, 
of Hasidus takes hours and hours and days. And simply, it didn't allow for him to sit and have Hasidus Shebalava Malkas where people sit around and tell stories. So, so that, I, I, when I read that, that put up things in perspective about him. He was also, from very young on, he was very intense in his avodas atfila and his davening, to the point where he once started to like bleed from, from his nose, from the intensity of concentration. This is what it says. And another chassid chastised the Rashbats, because the Rashbats was educating him in, in Hasidic lifestyle and also in Hasidic ideology. And he, he put this kind of pressure of focus and concentration on him, training him that way. And, it, and he, was on a, he, took, he was intense and, and it started to affect his health. So another chassid, Reb Zalman Zalatopolsky was his name, who, was a, who knew them both, chastised Rashbats for putting this pressure on the Rashab. And, and, and the previous, and the, and the Rebbe Marash, his father, Reb Shmuel, heard about it, and he sided with Reb Zalman Zlatopolsky, and he asked Rashbats not to pressure the Rashab. But what do we see from this? We also see that Rashab was a very intense person. So his intensity of, 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 of studying Hasidus took all of him. You know, like, you know, there's some people, you can do a few, you know, they do a few things at the same time. There's some people that when they immerse themselves in something, there's nothing else there. It seems to me that Rashab was that way from that comment that he didn't really have much time to hang out and listen to stories and, and history from Chassidim of, of, of yore because I was involved in learning Chassidus and understanding Chassidus. So, when he became the, the, the Rebbe, and, when he, and he taught Chassidus, and, and especially when he opened up his yeshiva in 1897, and the students, the first students, like I told you about Abshel Ber Zislin, were gifted and, and, and talented and knowledgeable. They all came in already very highly, knowing lots of Gemara and, and all that. And, and they, they, um, they identified with him in a way, and he introduced to them the whole concept of learning Chassidus deeply and davening with your Chassidus, and that was a Chiddush. But the style that he used was the analytical style. So you look, when you learn his Maimorim, and let's, let's take even the Kuntr Sumayin that we're learning now, Avi, which Kuntr Sumayin, like I told you, was written for who? For Balabatim, okay? <laughs> but let's, let's step back for a moment, right? We are learning now, we're holding, I think, at the eighth Maimor. We've learned quite a bit. And you, do you see how he takes <clears throat> this idea of Pnibiyah Sarotzen and Chitzayni Sarotzen? And he doesn't stop. He goes further and further. And each time he, he repeats and he adds. He repeats and he adds. He goes back. He, he, it's like he, he's, he's going, you know, he's, he's analyzing. He's, he's, tear, he's tearing open. He's, he, he's splitting hairs. And, 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 and this nuance and that nuance, that's what I mean. And this is a mimer for Balabatim. This isn't a mimer for Yeshiva Bacharim. This style <coughs> lent itself to what was happening in Russia at the turn of the century, which was the, the ism, the ism fad, communism, Zionism, intellectualism, humanism, <clears throat> All this was happening then. And the Rashab did an amazing thing that he was criticized for. What did he do? During the Sheva Brachas of the previous Rebbe, the previous Rebbe married Yud Gimel Elul, 1897. During the Sheva Brachas, he announces, the Rashab, the father, announces to the people and the guests that came, we are opening the Lababich Yeshiva. 1897, when Slabotke, I'm sorry, when, uh, when Vlozhin, the famous yeshiva that started in 1802, I think, in Vlozhin, closed its doors in 1892. 
You know why they closed its doors? I'll tell you the truth. Because many, in many books they tell you not nonsense. That why they closed the, <clears throat> the yeshiva is because Haskalah crept into the yeshiva. And the students who became radicalized with Haskalah basically threatened their Rosh Hashiva and that if you don't let us stay in the yeshiva, because the, 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 the Hanola, the administration, wants them out, you want to be, uh, you want to follow Haskalah, not in the yeshiva, and they caused an uproar where one, they pitted one Rosh Hashiva against the other. This is facts. This is not made up stories. You can look at it in academic books. There you'll see the truth of, of writers, okay? With sources. These are facts. And the government also put pressure and closed them down. So the government closed them down because of legal issues of not studying Russian in the yeshiva and other such issues. Together with the, the, the mapecha, the coup, and that the Haskola students who were radicalized with Haskola caused... 1892, Volozhin closes its doors. Almost 100 years, 90 years of a yeshiva or whatever, and, and, and the top Rosh Hashiva came out of it and Talmidim. And here, only five years later, in 1897, comes along the Lubavitch Rebbe, who knew of all this, because it's the same region, right? And he opens up a yeshiva. And he opens up a yeshiva for students. So the criticism that he got from Elder Lubavitcher Hasidim who came to the wedding was, what are you doing? You're basically opening a, a study hall. You're giving a, a place for Haskala to creep in now to your Hasidic, to students who are coming from Hasidic homes or other homes and want to be Hasidim. They want to learn Hasidis. Not, not, not only will the Litvax not only the Litvaks were, were impacted by Askola, now your Hasidish guys are going to be impacted. And they were against it. And he said to them, Rabbi Isai, you have two choices. Either you could support me or not. But the yeshiva is opening. And what, what so now ask yourself a question. What was he thinking? The answer is the famous talk that he gave, Simchas Teira, 1899. That he said that the students that learn in this Lubavitch Yeshiva, he quoted the Gemara called Yetzirah Muhammad Beis David, whoever goes out to the Davidic Wars, Kaisrin, get Christus. You have to write a get to your wife because in case you get killed in war, your wife shouldn't remain an Aguna, right? That's the halacha. So the Rashab cited that and he explained. You are going out, you students who are learning this yeshiva are going out to fight a war. What's the war? The war against secularism, against communism, against, uh, it was later, but against humanism, against all the isms, against Haskalah. Yes, you're fighting a war. And you should know you are in, 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 in David's and David Amelech's army. And you have, to, you want to succeed, you have to do one thing. Kairosim get Christus. You have to cut yourself off from Gashmias. If you will separate yourself from Gashmias in the sense of indulgence and all that, you will succeed. And these students accepted it 1899, Simchas 1899, and they became known as the Neiros Lahoyer, the lamplighters, which we call today in Chabad the lamplighters. That lamplighter Sicha started in 1899. And they became the lamplighters, and they took a led the way. And you should know that in Lubavitch, it was like living. There's a famous saying. Someone said that in Lubavitch, the world was back like 20, 30 years. So another chassid said, no, 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 100 years. <laughs> Not 20 years, 100 years. I mean, they literally... Well, we're just separated and totally involved in Avodah Hashem. It's another discussion of bringing Mitzvah Hashem one day to describe a little bit the atmosphere of what there was in Lubavitch at the turn of the century. It was phenomenal. But Bekitzer, Bekitzer, this, this was, this was what the Rashab created. 
Rashab and the previous Rebbe and his, and his staff. He had great mashpiyim. He had Rabbi Hanoi Hendel Kugel, who was a great grandfather of Rabbi Mendel Futtefas, who was a genuine, heartfelt Jew. He was from the first mashpiyim, Rabbi uh, Shmuel Groenim Esterman, Rashbats, Rabbi Michal Drauter. He brought, and here's another thing, I just remind myself that I want to tell, share with you. This Rabbi Groenim Esterman, Rabbi Shmuel Groenim, he was there like main teacher of Hasidus, okay? He was a Hasid of the Rashab's father. He never tra- really transitioned to become a Hasid of the, of the Rashab. Now I'm asking you, you're all either businessmen, former businessmen, you know, you, you, we, you know, I'm asking you, if you would hire someone to be a teacher for your students, or someone to market your product, if they didn't believe in you, would you hire them? You got to be cuckoo. You got to be crazy. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. The Rashab hired Reb Shmuel Grainem Esterman, who was a chassid of his father and never made the transition to become a chassid of his. And he becomes the lead mashpia. He, he was hired as the lead mashpia for the Rashab's new yeshiva. It makes no sense. And every time I think about this, because it blows my mind, it shows what kind of Jew the Rashab was. And what is that? He didn't do this for his own self-aggrandizement. He did it for the Bukharim. He wanted to create soldiers and leaders and people who will fight Haskalah and, 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 and fight assimilation. He felt they need to know about the culture of Chabad as it was for the last 50 years before his yeshiva began. And who was able to share that? All of those four mashpiyim. They all were from the Tzemach Tzedek's time. And such an important lesson for us. And, 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 and the end is, he was right. You know, he's right. The fact that he's not my chassid, and he's not learning my chassidus, he's learning my father and grandfather's chassidus, and really that's his allegiance... So what? So he and I will one day have you know, take two shot glasses and we'll, and, and we'll argue it out if, if it's important, which it isn't. But as far as the students, why should they be deprived <coughs> of knowing where they come from and what this movement and what this culture is about? And I think this is such an important lesson for us today. You know, in education, don't you have to choose the right educator. If it, to, whoever the right educator is, that's the one. Don't look at is he with me or is he against me. He's not going to. Of course, if 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 he if he openly goes against you, that's a problem. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who says, "Listen, I you know I I uh, my heart is elsewhere because when I was a student, I was a chassid of this rebbe of this rav." And now I be, I'm older and, and, and there's a situation and you, you want me to inspire and to teach. I'll do that. But you can't expect me to all of a sudden uh, change what I have in my heart. It doesn't work that way. And this is, this is a, a very sensitive issue but a very important issue. And the Rashab saw this. And that's why he was such a visionary. And that's why he, that's why he felt that even though Volozhin closed in 1892, and he opens in 1897 with Haskola rampant. He says, these four gentlemen who come from the previous generation, with the guidance of my son and myself, we will give them such power and such teaching, and, so, and we will create an environment which excludes the Kashmirs that they will, they will succeed. And he was right. Because the Shreb Shel Ber Zislin and others became Rabbonim later in 1908 and 1909 in this town and that town, and they made yeshivas and they made chadorim and, 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 they, and, and they built up Yiddishkeit. So, this is a little bit about the, the, the Rashab, uh, the Reb Shalom Ber, Ben uh, Shalom Ber, who, whose Hasidus we're learning right now, who brought. And this type of, and ever, and ever since, Avi, ever since 
he introduced his Maimorim to Lubavitch, the average Lubavitch student in yeshiva, if, if you want to know if he really understands Hasidus, must learn the Rashab's Hasidus. Can't get, can't get around it. To appreciate our Rebbe's Maimorim, you must learn the Rashab's Hasidus. Because the analytical style and the elaborate style is so helpful for understanding lines in the Kutitara, lines in other Rebbe's Maimorim. Yes, Hillel. I just want, I want to, some for another time, if you could uh, develop that idea in connection with the ma, ma marm of the rayats that we did for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, 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 right. the, the pet. I will, I will. I, I, this is only the beginning of our brain. We, we still have to look at the other Rabbeim and, like you said, the Rayats. But since it was the Rashabs, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, talk more. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate it. I just, uh, that came up as you said. Yeah. A- anyone else have a question? Yes, Jonas, a comment? Yes, Jonas. Yeah. It's very nice story about the Rebbe Rashab, how he got born. Uh, the Rebbe Rashab's mother had a dream about writing the Sefer Torah. Three people came to her and told her to write a Sefer Torah. And uh, she, she wasn't sure about it. And then a week later, it happened again. And she went to her husband, the Rebbe Marash. And later, the Samachsteli confirmed it, that the three people in the dream was uh, the outer level, the middle level, and the father, I think the father of the, of, of, of the woman who had the baby. Right. Right. And then what happened was, they went to the Semachsetic, and the Semachsetic told them that they should start writing the case of Torah right away. Right, right. Uh-huh. So they, they hired a... Um, they hired the Seifel and they started writing. A year later, the Seifel Torah was finished, just about finished. And um, and, and uh, the baby, the river of my life was born. And they wanted to have the Hachnasa Seifel Torah. So, so they went to the Semachsedek and the Semachsedek said, no, not now. So, so... One o'clock in the morning, the Semachsedic wakes up and he said, Now we have to do Haknasan Faith of Torah. And the Semachsedic goes out holding the Faith of Torah. The Rebbe Marash is holding the candle and they get the Gabayan to, to carry the Kupa. It's at two o'clock in the morning in, 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 in the town. And there was a, there was a, a town a chicken. And he's lying in the gutter, he wakes up and he sees the Rebbe Mahat turn the table tower. Now, the Samachsedi turned the table tower and he's wondering whether, whether he's been drinking too much. So he goes back to sleep and, he, and, and, and the next morning he wakes up and, 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 and he tells everybody and everybody thought he was a machine, but then the a few, a few, a few, um, few days later, it came out that what he saw was true. So I heard that from Yossi Paltier. From a Paltier, he told us the story. Yashikoyach, Yashikoyach. Everyone have a great day. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to read, we'll st- get, st- learn the mimer. So have you, my morim. And Mr. Shem, we'll continue to bring in the. Uh, uh, when we, we, you know, sooner than later. But uh, Avi, you want to say something? No. Okay. Zayda Zon. Take care, guys. Have a good day. Bye bye.